talk on how your deployment strategy influences how developers or people code. Um, first up, to introduce myself, I'm Chris Ng. I work at LinkedIn. I'm also a tech editor and contributor for both the LinkedIn Engineering Blog and the Ember Times, which is like the official newsletter for the Ember JS framework. Um, so, for my day job, I oops, I primarily work for um, LinkedIn, at working on their video product for like LinkedIn.com. You like upload a video on your feed or something like that, then that's like what my team works on. Um, actually, just train right away in New York City. So, what we'll, talk, what we'll be covering is what your deployment strategy is, different types of deployment strategy, um, any kinds of like tooling or practices or strategies revolving around your deployment and how that influences developers, and finally, some kind of key takeaways. So, first up, what is a deployment strategy? Um, like to kind of get a shared understanding between all of us, we in this talk will define that as what happens between when a code gets submitted to, let's say, master or release branch, um, just generally having your code um, in Git or SVM. Um, the deployment strategy is what happens in between that and when real users in production are using your application. So not like QA or not product managers, but actual end users for your product. So short fans, how many times do you deploy your, let's say your main application um, typically? Is it weekly, weekly, anyone? Yes. Should I go higher, maybe like monthly? Does anyone do monthly, some monthly? Um, <laughs> any kind of like, maybe like every other day, couple people every other day. Um, how about like the daily people? Daily, a little less about like every commit. Very little, very little for every commit. Um, so, why do we care about our deployment strategy? Um, I believe our the, the deployment strategy directly affects kind of like the engineering craftsmanship or the quality of the code, the predictability of actually getting stuff out, and the speed or the velocity of getting features and uh, requirements out. So everybody has a plan until they deploy to production. So. <laughs> Let's kind of try to have a plan. Um, let's go with it. Um, so to highlight, we'll go through like the typical the types of deployment uh, strategies. Um, so first up is kind of like the manual deployment strategy. Um, while you know usually we no longer manually get a flash drive and like go to a server and upload our code. Um, it's still very much common uh, these days, either for like internal applications or tools, or let's say your documentation for your code, um, maybe even internal docs. Um, your end users for your internal docs are still kind of like your developers, um, or maybe you have some strap like SEO pages from the early 2000s that you've never migrated. Um, these are still typically deployed manually. Um, so for a manual deployment strategy. It kind of sucks for developers because the craftsmanship takes a hit um, because there's no kind of feedback loop to your, develop feedback loop to your developers, meaning that once they submit their code, they might never know until you deploy it if it actually works or not, uh, or solves your problem. Um, there's no guarantee on when that change is going out either. It kind of depends on the physical whim of someone to manually deploy it. Um, and finally, if you, your developer then have to then have to manually deploy that code, um, that incurs kind of a velocity issue for them, uh, mainly because now they have to take time out of their day and like shepherd this deployment out to production. If there's any issues, they have to roll it back. Um, there's also a context switch that incurs some costs. Um, so definitely, you know, we can do better than manual deployments. Um, so. What, what comes to the next is kind of like what I call the early morning deployment, um, often done in a war in a war room, kind of like this. Um, you kind of like it might be a telephone war room where everyone jumps in the line and someone manually clicks uh, deploy, um, 
get some batch commits out into production, and you know, hopefully nothing goes wrong. Um, <laughs> but you, you never know, right? Uh, that's why it's usually done like very early in the morning to affect as less users as possible. Um, kind of shows you that it's not really like an international product um, because there is no like early morning that's not that the users. So this strategy um, kind of affects your deployment partnership. Um, they kind of now introduce this new deadline. They have to make the cut, or else they'll have to wait another, let's say, a week, month, maybe even a quarter, who knows, um, to kind of get their change out. So, you know, it's not great um, if they have like a day left uh, to submit their code. They might not test it, they might not put an integration test, they might just put a unit test, maybe just a snapshot test is like good enough, let's go ship it. Um, you know, product managers who wants this out. Um, so that's like introduces a craftsmanship issue. Um, also, in terms of velocity, um, this is not so great either. It's difficult to kind of get a feedback loop. Um, still, even if we have some sort of regular deployment cadence, um, if something goes wrong or regression happens, it's slow. It's not instantaneous feedback to developers that something is wrong. Uh, and then it's hard to kind of like track down which which commit caused the issue. Um, you have to maybe do a binary search tree on the commits to find out what's what's wrong, and then try to revert that, and then deploy hotfix. It slows everything down. Um, so like once, maybe like once a week or once a month. Um, Grinds everything to, uh, to halt. Um, everyone's all hands on deck and trying to deploy this thing out. So something better than that would be a continuous deployment cycle um, with quotes, because while it builds, like a machine builds your code, runs the automated tests, uh, maybe even cherry picks a commit, maybe that's probably even doing that. But once you commit your code into master, um, it runs through everything, gets out a release candidate or something that could be deployed into production, um, but however, actually clicking on the deployment button is done by a human person. Um, you know, which is reasonable for most uh, applications, I think. Typically, you would have kind of like an on-call team or just SREs maybe, or like just owners of the product to kind of shepherd this into production. Um, just to make sure, like top line metrics are still okay. Um, we have if like we have to revert something or something goes wrong, then you kind of need people alert. So it kind of introduced kind of like a minor velocity issue, um, and it's like not very predictable when your commit is going to prod. Maybe you do it every every day, so you kind of know like within the day I'll get my commit out if I commit it to master. However, it's really great for craftsmanship and predictability. Because, because now we have like a schedule. It's very predictable when your change is going out. At worst, it's kind of like 2x of your deployment schedule. So if you do it every day, at worst, maybe, oh, um, I missed a deployment window, I'll have to go the next day. It's not too bad. Um, however, um, it's also really great for craftsmanship because now developers are more interested in like, doing automated testing, uh, making sure their change is good to go. Um, because there's no, like, there is a deadline, but it's not like a rigid deadline because it's kind of always rolling, always happening. Um, so this feedback loop is kind of happening to developers. They can get their change out as soon as possible, see, oh, it like increased error rates. Um, let's kind of like put a fix for that and, you know, slowly iterate instead of kind of doing a one big splash. Finally, we have the truly continuous deployment cycle uh, deployment strategy without books. Um, in this strategy, we build, verify, deploy, and maybe even roll back your code um, if it harms metrics, um, automated without a single human touching it. Well, maybe a human like just checking that it's still working. Uh, but it's you know frequent releases, no waiting. Maybe you can do this for every commit, maybe every batch of commits. Um, it kind of like differs place to place. However, it can easily break. So if something goes wrong, the production breaks. Um, you know that's not something you might want to incur if you don't have the operations team to um, shepherd this along. So 
because of that, it kind of introduced a minor craftsmanship issue. Developers might be incentivized to kind of just test and broad, you know, like let's just get it something out. Um, if it's bad, someone else will revert it for me. Like, it doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> um, there's like less kind of reliance on automated testing because, you know, it's going to get out broad, it'll get reverted, it's fine. Uh, however, it's really great for like, velocity and predictability. You know every commit you get to prod, it's going to get, or every commit you make to master, it's going to get to prod within, let's say, three hours or four hours. Um, that's really great um, if you miss a window. That's just another like four hours. It's not too bad. Um, you can miss a window within a day and still make it into produ production. Um, and for velocity-wise, everything, there's like this instant feedback loop of like you commit something in master and find out something's wrong right away. Um, or something's great, who knows. So to support all of these deployment strategies, we kind of have like some, we usually rely on some scheduling, tooling, or some tactics. Um, I'll go through a couple of them today. Um, first up is a 2017 study by uh, Facebook on moving kind of like the cutoff date for deployments. Um, in this case, it was app releases for Android and iOS, but I think we can extend the analogy to uh, web development. So the dots in red are the Thursday cutoff, and the dots in blue are the Sunday cutoff. And so the higher it is, and the more commits they have that was um, kind of push the day of the release, um, which is like not great because that means like a lot of people are trying to get stuff into master um, on the last day. Um, it's like less reliable that what you have in master is good. Um, and in the same study, they found that deadline, there are deadline effects to um, code. So code that, that is committed to master on the deadline is, on average, worse quality than code not committed on the deadline. Um, most likely because developers are trying to rush it in um, and trying to cut corners, right? Um, so in their study, they tried to move it from from a Thursday to a Sunday, and like obviously a lot more, a lot less people are trying to work in the weekend. Um, so there's been a sharp decline on commits done on a Sunday. Um, so at LinkedIn, we have something called three by three. Um, we try to release three times a day um, into production with like kind of the goal of getting um, something committed to master into production in under three hours. Um, with no manual testing, fully end-to-end -end automated testing, um, no kind of like manual QA. So this kind of like empowers developers and product owners to own the application and be part of the deployment rather than just be kind of like shipping off to some other team and let them deal with it and they'll have at some point get into production and you'll see your results. Um, to support this, we have like an integration environment. Um, I think it's very um, kind of common these days. So encourage early integration between teams. Make sure that all of our connections are working as expected. Everyone's kind of like agreeing to their contract um, between API and web, or like between components within the web um, SBA or single page app. So. The ideal scenario here is to mimic it as much as possible as production because every kind of deviance you have in production is a chance of having one of these bugs that um, only encounter, you only encounter in production and not in the development environment. And whenever you have that, it kind of just pushes your developers more and more into just testing in production rather than the integration environment because you know that's the sort of that's the sort of truth. They can't really trust the integration environment, so you know, might as well test it wrong. An integration environment reduces your risk because you, as as I said, uh, you do some early integration between teams and find out the issues before it affects like millions of users. Another deployment tactic we use is a canary deployment. So, let's say for example, all those blue boxes are your servers that you have. Um, so 
So what we do typically is we take one of them and deploy a code, um, like the new kind of depth of code, and compare one of the blue boxes with, let's say, this yellow box, which is that new code, and find out if like error rates went up, um, if there's more JavaScript exceptions, if it takes more of your CPU usage, um, any kind of like real world errors that you won't really encounter by manually QA testing it or writing all of those automated testing. Um, it's kind of hard to catch every single edge case, um, especially when you're kind of like driven by user generated content. Um, yeah, it's really hard to do it by yourself. So kind of like offload it to some real world users, but not all of them. So what if there's an issue? Um, we can either do a hotfix, a rollback, or a fix forward. Hotfix is like when you take what's already in production and you make a branch of it that fixes that issue and you deploy that. Um, not taking like the, so you're not like committing it the master and then deploying the newest master. Fix forward is when you commit something into master to fix the issue and then deploy everything else, um, including that um, latest commit. And a rollback is simply just going to a previous release candidate um, and mitigating the issue for me. So the rollback is, in my opinion, the safest option because either way, not fixing or fixing forward, um, you're not quite 100% sure if you're actually catching the issue. And that's going to incur a lot more um, churn in like, testing it out in production. And then you're like, oh, it doesn't actually work. So we have to roll back um, or fix forward again. Um, and then by that time, maybe you've had this issue for over 24 hours. And a lot of people are angry at you. A lot of pipe managers are angry at you. Um, so ideally, you try to roll back. Um, next up is another deployment tooling that we have, um, which is a change request tracker. So imagine if you're trying to see what's in production. You open up your that console, you type in your like app and see the version number, and you're like, oh, this this is the actual version that I need, and you need to test your code and find out that you're you've fixed the problem and everything's good. This is kind of like a very manual process that might take a while, but if like you have some caching on, you have to like clear cache. What if you forgot to like refresh your browser when you have deployed your code? Um, lots of things can go wrong. Lots of manual um, process that can incur some, you know, <coughs> common mistakes. Um, so what you can do is have a change request tracker which shows every like release candidate you have. So 9.1.5.6 and 9.7 are kind of like let's say numbers version numbers for your release candidates. Um, and then you can say that, oh, 9.1.7 is on the first fabric, um, while 9.1.6 is all the points in the prod, um, and then 9.1.5 has been rolled back. So please don't like deploy that code into production. This way, it's kind of like in the bird's eye view, you already know what um, needs to be uh, what's going into production, what's currently in production, and so forth and so forth. Um, but now we kind of like need to match this to the commit that you actually have. So we have another kind of view of commits. You can filter by commits by yourself. Um, so you can see that, oh, for my commit to fix the header over overflow, it's currently going into production, but it's in the um, integration environment right now, so I can test an integration environment. And I know that I can update like stakeholders to say that, oh, it's getting pushed into production as we speak. So it'll probably be there in like 10, 20 minutes um, to all fabrics, right? So it, the idea kind of is to reduce human error and to be transparent about the progress um, where your commit is going to. So you can just send people a link um, and they can track it for themselves. And it's like a lot more predictable than manually checking um, your browser's console every now and then. Finally, another way we kind of 
mitigate issues are feature flags or you know commonly used for A/B testing. Um, so the idea is to have a service that returns to you like true or false. Um, it can be a little more complicated, like giving you values or um, any kind of like like you can give it like maybe 10, 20, 30 if you want to give it like different uh, customizations. But the general idea is that you can turn features on and off. Um, so this kind of enables us to do larger migration changes. So you can have both, both paths running at the same time. Uh, if you want to migrate to kind of a new system, then you just turn the flag on and see how real world users interact with it. It's not kind of like working as well as you can or as well as you want, then you can turn it off and then work on it again. Um, however, we don't need to do a new deployment because it's just like a feature flag. Um, like the server response will just return false, so it will, won't run that particular code path and kind of encapsulate our issues and changes away. So this is important, especially working with large teams, because you kind of don't want to break production so, so frequently that you halt every other team um, in your department um, with their progress. So, Let's say, for example, if I'm working on video on the feed and I'm trying to change something within it, um, if something's wrong with it, then obviously we kind of have to roll, roll it back. But if we have a feature flag, then we can just turn that off and keep on deploying while our team uh, internally fixes it. Um, this also makes it easier for to see any like metrics shift because once you turn something off, you should see the error rate go down or kind of like you know, the success criteria go up. So yeah, it keeps, uh, keeps velocity up. So some key takeaways for our talk today is like really try not to make a build cut. A build cut is kind of like the root of all of our problems, um, especially when dealing with velocity, craftsmanship, um, and predictability. Well, it is predictable in that it's happening every every time, but it kind of makes your developers a lot less um, it's a lot less ideal for them because now they have to make a cut or else they've missed their product shipment date. Um, Infrared deploys usually kind of high developer pain points. Um, if we deploy only like once a month. You know, it's kind of okay, like people will kind of be okay with poor tooling or like heavy manual testing because it only kind of happens once a month. It's not always like in your line of sight as a pain point. Um, so it's kind of like the, the pain points are kind of hidden by the infrequent um, nature of it. There's also an opportunity cost to not to not delivering software, and not just in terms of like revenue or any kind of like business metric, but also in terms of like the development team learning from their mistakes, learning to see if their code um, causes some regression or um, fixes the problem. Um, there's there's a cost to not delivering software, and the more deployments you do, actually reduces the risk because the the amount of depth between two deployments, if you've done it like every commit versus every uh, every week, is a lot larger. So <clears throat> it's a lot easier to isolate like issues rather than um, waiting once a month to patch that corner case. And of course, automate what's reasonable for you. I am not saying here to everyone to go into a very continuous deployment strategy. Um, deploying every commit that they have. Um, <clears throat> it kind of depends on your operating model, how frequent you kind of need changes in. One size doesn't fit all. Um, so make it what you wish. And that's it for it. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. Yeah. Can you describe how your strategy for isolating your subset of users? I mean, is it geography server? Do you fix actual users? How do you do that? So we usually isolate um, users using <coughs> our feature flagging uh, mechanism. For Canary deployments, it's purely kind of randomized kind of subset of users. Because you kind of want like a full range of international users, every kind of like bandwidth connection you see. If, because you know, your app might work fine for all US users, but it doesn't work well for um, someone in France with them. Yeah. The study that you mentioned where they moved the deadline to Sunday, did that actually result in an increase in code quality, or did people still push on Friday afternoon to go home and their bugs just sat for two days? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. It's based on the study. <laughs> it was more of like driving the point that the deadline effects are real and you know causes people to rush things. Yep. Your feature flags you implement them on both your front end or on your back end uh, API as well. Um, what do you mean by that? Sorry. So I, I, I've seen some people well, it, say that it's, it's not easier to just um, deploy your your back end services. Yeah. And then you turn things on off the front end. Uh, you, whether you expose them or not. Yes. Yes, that's correct. So, so your back end doesn't have a feature flag. It also does have. Yeah, so it's because they might do a, like a migration that doesn't really affect the front end, and so they can test it out themselves. How, how do you do that? Like, what's the best way to do that with the back end? Um, you mean like? Yeah, right. So like, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, right, with the service where you just have like a fully and true or false for your feature, yeah. right? That's easy. You could probably do that through like a call, like an HTTP call. But how how would you? Share that same feature in a, in a couple front end to the back, and then you want to turn them on or off together, right? Like, how would you? Is that what so you they need, do? they need to like either rely on the same boolean um, or like the same like AB testing name, yeah. or rely on this like same ID. Um, and since the back end can make calls like by themselves, then it's quite easier for them to incur that cost to like call up. Every time there's a request coming in, call like the AB testing service and find out if it should be true or false. Are you using kind of tools to manage the feature flags or is it custom thoughts? Yes, it's like an internal tool. Yeah. But there's a lot of like um, external tools or like companies that provide that service now. Yes. Your, your iteration environment, the, the size of that environment, is that uh, very close to production? Like, I don't know how many servers you might have in the production around the world, but what's the size of your integration testing percentage-wise compared to your production environment? The size of the environment? So yeah, right now we have like, two, like, if you have like 300 servers around the world, is your integration environment also 300 servers? No, it's usually all fast. So that is kind of like, a risk, I guess, that you have in a back-end scenario where it doesn't handle scale well. Um, but in the front end sense, we're sending JavaScript over this over the wire, so it doesn't really matter that much. Do you enforce a single threaded deployment through your integration environment, um, or do you let two teams use that as deploy independently, um, cause you know potential yeah. conflict? Yeah, it's single thread right now. Yeah. yeah. No, because we are only like deploying usually to like a couple boxes for Canary, so it's kind of hard to look test a couple boxes. Um, it's kind of more used to see the differences between similar amount of boxes. We do load testing in a different um, cycle. Yep. So what what would be the road uh, scaling base that you would suggest? Because when uh, the initial deployment will uh, start, mm -hmm. it will reduce the capacity available. So, uh, how, how do you make that? Um, sorry, can you repeat that question? So let's take, for example, I have 10 boxes. Okay. And then 
when HLE deployment will start, one box will go down when deployment is going on. So it will reduce the capacity. So what would be your load to capacity is to use? Uh, your suggestion or how to manage that? So it does reduce the capacity, so we usually always try to be above capacity, so it still works. I think it still is able to handle it well. How do you prevent the uh, Incentivizes people to clean up their code. 